So we're looking at page 38, numbers 13, 14, and 15. So these questions are asking us to find the curvature for particular vector value functions. Uh, we're kind of going the distance here. <clears throat> the recommendation is to use the shortcut formula for curvature. So find the curvature of uh, cosine t, comma sine t, comma 1. Right? So if you're looking at that function, it's really just a circle. Right, so if you can kind of play that out in your mind, you can save yourself a lot of time and energy. But we'll do the work. But the idea is that, you know, don't, don't waste your time doing the work, especially for a multiple choice question, if it's something that you can play out in your mind. All right, so R of T, cosine T, comma sine T, so this is a unit circle with a height of one on the Z axis. So R prime of T, so it's really just translated upward one unit. Okay, so just kind of consider that. Consider what that means. And I'll show you a little shortcut to be able to figure this out. All right? <clears throat> Aside from just playing it out in your mind, which is easier said than done in a lot of cases. So negative sine of t, cosine t, 0. All right? Then magnitude. So that's sine squared plus cosine squared, plus zero squared, so I'm not gonna write that. Under the radical is gonna give a result, you know, Pythagorean identity, done this enough at this point, I'm gonna give you a result of one, all right? Which means T of T, which is the ratio of your derivative function, vector value function, divided by, so the ratio of that to its magnitude is going to be exactly the same. So negative sine t cosine t zero. Now I need the derivative of that, t prime of t, so negative cosine t, negative sine t, also zero for the last component. And then I need the magnitude of that. So cosine squared plus sine squared plus zero if you want, but I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I didn't do it before, so I'm not going to do it now. Result is equal to one. And so if I want my kappa value, the magnitude of t prime of t, one. The magnitude of r prime of t, also one. Result is one. All right. So let me show you how you can kind of play this out. Like, like I said before, you can do it in your mind if that's, if that's something that, that you find interest in doing. But you could also sort of play it out using transformations. All right, so what this is, is a unit circle translated up one unit. on the z-axis, right? So I'm going to try to draw a perspective diagram here, but you, you know. You know the drill, not the drill. So here's what it would be in the xy axis, xy plane. Oh, it just looks so bad. I, ju I, just, I just can't draw. I mean, that, that's really what it comes down to, right? I'm just gonna try to do it in like, like an ellipse so that it kind of looks like a perspective diagram. And then you're just gonna give me the benefit of the doubt and say, he's trying, he's trying so hard. And because of that, uh, I'm gonna get a lot of wiggle room here. Because honestly, you're just, you're just so nice about it. And that, that, that's never not appreciated. <clears throat> and I honestly, I mean, it may sound like I'm being a wise guy, but I really mean it. Like the fact that people are able to put up with my crappy diagrams, is, uh, it means a lot. Right. So we're translating it up 
one unit. So we're imagining that this is one unit. But ultimately, we're dealing with the same figure. All right? So every point gets translated up exactly one unit plus one. I'll try to do my best over here. Plus one. All right, so if you know that you're dealing with the same figure, then what we can do is pretend that we're working on the X, in the XY plane. So a unit circle has a radius of one. We discovered in the previous problem that the curvature of a circle with a radius of A is equal to one over A. So this value one corresponds with that value one and that's the end of it, all right? So once you identify that what you're working with is actually a circle, then all you need to do is identify the, cir the, the circle's radius and once you have that, then you have the curvature and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Right? So if you come across a multiple choice question on the test that involves finding the curvature of something that you know to be a circle, my expectation is that you won't show the work. Right? I, 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 don't, I, don't want to, I just want to see the answer. Now, some people will show the work because it's like, well, well what, if I'm, what if I'm guessing wrong here? And that's fine, that's a different story. You know, you're hedging your bet, that's different. All right, but there are ways, plenty of ways to come up with your answers without having to go through all the trials and tribulations. Like number 14, it's a straight line. You know the curvature is zero. So the problem's done. I can tweak this one by saying prove the curvature of any straight line is zero in R3. Ah, now, now I've changed the flavor of the problem. All right, so first thing we'd have to do is develop a vector value function to represent a line, any, any line in R3. All right, so as long as the three components are linear, then you'll have a line. All right. Now I can, I, can do, I can show you how that will work for in R2 with Desmos, because I don't want to open GeoGebra right now. It's too much of a pain, but if I were to say, you know, let, let me define A and B. So A equals zero, creates a slider. B equals zero, creates a slider, all right? And so I'm gonna create the model A plus BX, so A plus BT, with B being the uh, slope, comma, A plus B T. And then I'll give it I'll give it some kind of domain that's a little bit more significant than zero to one, maybe like negative ten to ten. And you say, but there's nothing there. And I say, yeah, 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 yeah. I I have the A and B values defaulted at zero. That that that's just a point zero zero. So let me let me give it something. Let me give it some juice here. Let me get four. Oh, look, now we get a line. All right, the issue with this that we run into is that we've limited ourselves in the sense that the whatever the x value is, is going to be the same as the y value. All right, so there's, there are ways to handle this. We could sub it. You say, okay, well, now I have that and that, and you say, well, now A and B are, are not defined, but it, it asked me if I wanted to find sliders for them, so I can. But maybe, maybe I wanna go with my subscript approach, All right? So I can take these values, uh, A, B, A1, B1, and just you know, rewrite them just with uh, A2 and B2. You know, so you don't, wanna, you don't wanna restrict yourself, but you also don't wanna make things overly complicated. Right? So you find that little balance there. Oh, uh, Supposed to be a B. All right, 
And so now I can sub these with twos. And now I have an expression that represents a linear equation in R2 that's dependent on constants A1, B1, A2, B2, representing the, a constant value for each component and also a slope value for each component. So I can, I can kind of wiggle this around here and you can see now I'm not, I'm not limited. I can have a variety of different slopes and y-intercepts and things like that. All right, so that's how it would work in R2. So it's not much of a stretch to say that, okay, it's probably gonna be the same idea in R3. So let's say we have A1 plus B1T, A2 plus B2, T, A3 plus B3, T, to incorporate a third component, all right? So I would still go through the same approach of finding the derivative. The good thing about a linear model is any constant is gonna zap away to zero. The slope of a linear function is, is, act, is actually that, that linear function's derivative. So my derivative here is gonna be B1, B2, B3. The magnitude's gonna be a little wonky. It's like my overused word of the year for some reason. Forgot to square it. I felt like I, I, I'd written enough too, so I was done. No, I gotta put the power there. B cubed, no, B sub three squared under the radical. Now, t of t, it ain't gonna be pretty. It's gonna be this as a denominator for each entry in R prime of t. So I'm just gonna rewrite it. Let me just get me, copy. So, get a couple of numerators going on here. I didn't give that enough time to lock in, so let me do that. It doesn't want to lock in. It's just telling me I got to do it by hand. Oh, so it is so uncivilized. All right, so we have B1. B2, B3. All right, now looking at this, you might say, oh, well, we're gonna be in a journey, in for a ride here to find our uh, derivative of our unit tangent vector. And I say, actually, we are not going to be in for a ride, or, or if we are in for a ride, it's gonna be a short one because all of these numerical values regardless of the fact that they're represented by Bs, they're all just coefficients, constants. Right? There's no Ts in here anywhere. The derivative of each component is gonna be zero. So it actually ends up giving the zero vector, the magnitude of which is zero. So my kappa value is gonna be zero over, you know, we still got that magnitude of R prime of T component or idea. You don't have to really write it because unless it's a zero itself, the whole thing is gonna zero out. So zero over that is gonna give a result of zero. Oh, I see, it keeps merging with the, um, the radical when, I, when it's auto-correcting. All right, well, it is what it is, but we got the zero. That's all that matters, all right? So then number 15 is asking for the curvature of the parabola traced out by th that vector value function. Now we've already done a little bit of work with that, so we might as well make use of our work. All right, we, we did it with a particular value, but let's, let's kind of steal our work and take it the distance. All right, because it's not, it's no longer at a particular value. We need it in general terms. All right. So 
we have this stuff here. We did the hard work to come up with the um, unit tangent vector. So now I need the derivative of the unit tangent vector. So that'll be a, that'll be a treat. A little bit of uh, quotient rule. It's actually not terrible. It's just like, I don't know too many people who were really in love with the uh, quotient rule back in Calc 1. So if you, if you had to do the quotient rule twice in one problem, you really weren't, weren't having too much fun. This is along those lines. You know, the second component you could actually rewrite to use the chain rule, but I'm going to use quotient rule in both cases. So, low d high. Oh, oh, that moved on me. Low d high. So, 2 radical 4t squared plus 1 minus the high 2t d low. So, you know, denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. My iPad keeps moving on me. 1 half 4t squared plus 1 to the negative 1 half times 8t. So that's the numerator over the denominator squared, which is just 4t squared plus 1. The other component, low d high, that's easy because d high is going to 0. So then it's minus high d low. So d low is the same for the second piece as it was for the first piece. So I'm just going to copy that over. Over denominator squared and away we go. If you remember the fun rhyme. Honestly, I didn't even learn that rhyme until I was a teacher. Some student was like, uh, hey, you know there's a cool rhyme? I was like, oh, how does it go? I'm like, okay, I'll use it. All right, so that's our derivative of the unit tangent vector. So now we just gotta, gotta square that and add it all together, put a root over it, and then we'll have our numerator. Sounds like fun. Right. Oh, we'll do a little housekeeping though. Might as well, right? So, before we even get into the part where we're actually going to start trying to make a magnitude out of this, let's clean it up a little bit. All right, so the twos go away here. These two can come together. To give you 8t squared. All right, so I'm going to rewrite. So we're looking at 2, and I'm going to write this as 4t squared plus 1 to the 1 half minus 8t squared over 4t squared plus 1 to the 1 half. I'm just going to move that down to the bottom, or make it the, make it the denominator of the 8t squared, I should say over 4t squared plus 1. I'm going to actually write that to the first power to be weird for a second. I have a reason for that. For the other one, that's actually a whole lot easier. And you'll see actually the reason why I put it to the first power for the first piece. First power for the first piece is the uh, same reason why I'm going to do it here. Because we can do the keep the base subtract the exponents step because this is just a, uh, a set of factors in the numerator. You know, we could still do the part where we cancel the 2 with part of the 8. Well, actually, in the other one, we cancel the 2 with the 2, but we can cancel the 2 at some point. That'll give us a 4. We're still going to have a negative. But now I can actually bring this piece right on down to the bottom, merge it with the other one, and come up with a denominator of uh, 4t squared plus 1 to the 3 halves power. Alright, so we'd have negative 4t up top, and then on the bottom, 4t squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. Alright. 
it. I wrote huge to start off, so I'm gonna shrink it down. But for this one, we were in for a ride no matter how you sliced it, so. I could have written like super tiny and it was still taking a little bit of room. All right. So then, let me get something that you could actually see there. So then I wanna clean up this other fraction, you know, the one in red. So I'm gonna think of this as an expression over one. You could use a little keep change flip. And when I do that, I'll just kind of give you a visual of it. It's really taking this fraction and it's reciprocal and multiplying it by the top and bottom. All right, so I'll actually, I'll tuck that little step in there. Use a highlighter to accentuate it. I think I already copied it. I don't know why I did that again. Classic Bob. Which is weird because my name's not Bob. Alright, so I'm going to multiply, I'm going to multiply, see it's the same as multiplying by 1, right? So, we're good there. These two will cancel each other out when I multiply them together, so these two, boom, boom, denominator gone. Right. Then, I'm going to take this and distribute it here, and then over here. So, in doing so, I'm going to get 2 over, let me write it a little bigger, I'll shrink it down later, 2 over 4t squared plus 1 to the 1 half, write it as a radical if you want, minus 8t squared over 4t squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. And then everything else stays as is. Now we can get to the point where we can find the magnitude now if we want. We could also get a common denominator and say, you know, get a little greedy. See if we can make this look even nicer. You know, maybe, maybe it won't. But if it does, then, then we'll be happy for it. You know, that's really kind of where we're at at this point. All right, so it's just a matter of being greedy because if we do a little algebra now, maybe it's less writing later on. All right, so if I do that, then what I would look, I would be looking to do would be multiply top and bottom of this fraction. Let me make that a little thinner. See, what is that? That's a 0.55. Let me bring this up to like 0.4. So 4t squared plus 1 to the 1 half up top. And then, oh, actually, I'm sorry, to the first. And then a 4t squared plus 1 on the bottom. That'll give us the common denominator, because when we add the 1 and the 1 half, that'll give us 3 halves. We can distribute. And so we'd be looking at 8t squared plus 2 minus another 8t squared, so just 2 actually very surprising over 4 t squared plus 1 to the 3 halves comma negative 4 t over all that stuff I'm just making it a little consistent in the writing now you might look at what I've just done here with all this algebra and said if you did it with the chain rule this would have come out quicker in some cases, yes. Some cases, no. It depends on the situation. So do it in a way that makes sense to you. Uh, algebra is algebra. You know, just make it happen. All right. So we got that. Now I need the magnitude. So I'm going to square each part. So four over four t squared plus one cubed plus 16t squared over 
the same thing. All under a radical. Because again, when you square an exponential expression, you're just multiplying the power by two. So three halves times two, it just gives you a three. All right, so that gives you four, which could actually be factored out. I don't know how valuable of a step that is, but we're looking at four plus 16 t squared over four t squared plus one cubed under the radical. Almost there, almost there. That's our numerator for our kappa. Now I just need to figure out the denominator. I mean, we already have it. It's just a matter of kind of putting it all together. So kappa is going to be equal to that lovely thing. Over what we got for the magnitude of r prime of t, which is this lovely thing. All right, so there's, you know, we, we could stop here if we want, but I, I kind of want to go a little further to see if it, if it cleans up. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. You know, so I'm going to write this as the radical 4 plus t, uh, 16t squared. <clears throat> over 4t squared plus 1 back to the 3 halves power. Can't seem to get away from that. Now this radical here, this could be thought of as a radical over or a fraction over 1. So I can multiply, keep changing flip, 1 over the square root of 4t squared plus 1. But really, that's the same as saying, pause for dramatic effect, the same thing, but to the one half power. When you multiply, you keep the base and add the exponents. So now I'm looking at four plus 16 t squared over four t squared plus one, three plus one is four, so squared. Also a GCF on the top, like I mentioned before, you could pull that out. So two radical one plus four T squared under the radical. Denominator stays put for the time being. All right, so I can write that as two times one plus four T squared to the one half over same denominator but the bases are now the same so we could actually simplify even further it's like really this thing was so ugly it had no alibi all right but it looks like it's going to clean up kind of nicely because again i can keep the base at, uh, subtract the exponents and get two over 4t squared plus 1 is bringing this bad boy down. 2 minus a half is 3 halves. And so this would represent our kappa value in simplest form. Not always going to be required to do that, you know, simplify it all the way. But it's nice to know that when you can, you can. And you really can, you know. And so what this gives us is the measure of curvature for that particular parabola. All right, now... What does that mean? Well, it, it, it tells us that depending on where you are along the parabola, you're gonna obviously have varying degrees of curvature. So let's just take a quick look at the vector value function that we're starting with. t squared plus one comma t. Close them up and we make this, uh, I'll do negative 10 to 10, kind of make it interesting. And it's sideways parabola. The curviest part should be right smack dab at that vertex there. 
you know, if I wanted to kind of get an idea of where that was, zero to 10, well, zero seems to be the start, zero to one, all right, it's expanding outward from there. So when t is equal to zero, it appears that we have the curviest part of the graph. All right, so what I can do is I can look at my kappa value. I can put that in terms of x. I can put it. It, it can do a lot of things, but I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna put it in terms of x. Two divided by it would be four x squared plus one. Because you could also just do it, you know, computationally. Just do it by hand. Raised to the three halves. All right. So that would be your function. All right. Uh, I'll call it f of x. So I can do some substitutions. And I could just test a bunch of values, but I think it's pretty clear based off of the graph. Let's take a quick look. Just based on what you see here, which looks very much like, uh, kind of like a uh, PDF, probability density function, you know, normal curve kind of thing. It's pretty clear that when the x value is equal to zero, that the curve, the curvature, which is represented by f of x, is at its highest point. So the y value is at its highest point. All right. So, and that's consistent with the graph here. When t was equal to zero, it's at its curviest point, and then it gets less and less curvy as it moves outward from there. So we could actually get a sense. We can develop a graph of curvature using another function, which I think is pretty cool. So then you can actually determine using calculus when a graph is the curviest. So if you're thinking about Calc 1, I could say find the derivative of this and use a sign chart, for example, to make a determination of when the graph is at its curviest. All right, so it's pretty, pretty interesting applications.